Welcome to this latest edition of the Real Deal Podcast. I'm your host, of course, Surreal Gerald Quinn. On this 22nd of September 2022, season 15, episode 848 of the Real Deal Podcast. Approaching, what, 850? 850 in a couple of weeks. I uh, hope everybody out there is having a great week. We are near the weekend, thank God. Uh, starting to get eh, not chilly yet. A little, it was a little humid in the, in the DMV. But anyway, we're going to get right to it. Um, I am rolling solo tonight. Uh, we will not be joined by Robert Sapp. Uh, he'll be back next week. But guess what? In his honor, this, this podcast is going to be rated B for Bills. There's going to be a lot of Bills, Bills, Bills. Okay, up in this podcast, uh, as the Buffalo Bills are just running a rough shot through the NFL right now, even through two games. And that's going to be where we begin with our themes. This is what I did with at Alabama. Talk more about that. And, of course, super team. Do we have a super team in the making in terms of the Buffalo Bills? Um, So I'm going to introduce a new segment to it to the game, uh, to the podcast. But you know what? We're going to save this segment. We're actually going to skip this segment because Robert Sapp is not here. And the, We can't do a Buffalo Bills segment without Robert Sapp. So put a pause on this segment, but we'll give you a little preview. We're going to do a, Bill, a Bills segment every podcast. This team has a chance to be a special team. I think, along with Robert Sapp, think that thinks that they can win 15 games, maybe even more. They could be a dominant team in the mode of the 85 Bears in the mold of, say, the 84-49 ers some a team like that. I really believe that this team has that type of potential. But we'll save that segment for next week. Uh, game of the week, uh, without question, this is the game of the week, an early candidate for game of the year. And I, I guarantee you, when we look back at the 2022 season, this will be a top five game of the year. This was a spe- – Miami, of course, take out upset – the Baltimore Ravens in Baltimore, 42-38. to 38. This was a wild game. You're talking about Miami putting up 35 second-half points, 28 in the fourth quarter. They outscored They outscored uh, Baltimore 35-10 in the second half, despite the fact that Baltimore had 155 yards rushing, and despite the fact that both quarterbacks, uh, Lamar Jackson was spectacular. Both quarterbacks, this, what makes a classic game, Especially regular season game is when both quarterbacks are are, are operating at an optimum level. Both these quarterbacks were off the charts. I mean, just making play after play. Uh, Tua had the absolute game of his life. The a game that maybe changes the the uh, direction of his career. If Tua goes on to become an All Pro franchise caliber quarterback, we're going to look back at this game as being the one. That that started it for him. Uh, he was spectacular, uh, well over 400 yards passing. Um, he threw for six touchdowns, and of course, he led the charge in that great fourth quarter as Miami just completely shocked the Baltimore Ravens. Listen, here's what I'm here's what I'll say about the Ravens, and I saw this with a couple franchises uh, in the last five years. When you lose the core of who you are, it is tough to be at a championship level. And what I mean by that is the Ravens for years, Ravens for years, excuse me, let's get some water here, for years have been known as a defense, defensive first, running game team, second, running game second type or type team. That's how they build their reputation. Defense, running game. Yes, now they still have the running game with Lamar Jackson when the backs are healthy, and they had you know had 155 yards rushing in this game. That defense scares no one anymore. They used to walk on you teams used to be defeated before they stepped on the field playing the Ravens defense. But you know the those the Ray Lewis Ed Reed days, those are long gone, long gone. Like that defense scares no one. When I mean no one, it scares no one. What Miami did to them in that second half was, I mean, they went like, I mean, it just went, they just cut them up. I mean, they they, they cut, I mean, I can't take Baltimore serious as a Super Bowl contender with, with that defense. You just can't, especially in the AFC. You're talking about, you're, you're playing, you're talking about being a conference with Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen and Justin Herbert. Like, there's no, like, you know, Russell Wilson, like, there's no way. The AFC is too loaded. For, the, for me to take Baltimore seriously as a Super Bowl contender. 
I think they they will still win that division, just off sheer talent and Lamar. You know, if he stays healthy, but I that Baltimore defense is no longer it, it's just not the same. It's just not. But despite that, this the game, the story of this game was about Miami, and the potential of just a offense that can just scare anybody in the league. Miami on any given Sunday can beat anybody. They have talent up and down the board on both sides of the ball. I don't know what you I don't know how you defend um how you defend them. Like Tyreek Hill to me is the best <clears throat> excuse me, the best deep threat since Randy Moss. He's not as good as Moss because Moss was six four and could jump out the Jump out the uh jump you know had a forty you know forty inch plus vertical but he takes the top off any defense at any time and it doesn't have to be just straight go routes we're talking about slants um he can take like you know reverses like you can get the ball in his head in his uh, hands in a, in a plethora of ways and crossers things of that nature and again he makes you look like you had a blown coverage one of the, one of those catches was was a blown coverage. The other ones were not blown coverages. It was just like he just run. He just is that. He's just the fastest player in the league. He just runs runs past everybody, despite the fact that you know, <laughs> you know what's coming as far as as far as what people wanting the quarterback wanting to go deep to get uh, to uh, to get to Tyree Gill. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. He takes the he takes the top off any defense. I don't care how far back you play your safeties. Again, you hit a, you can run crossers, slant patterns, things of that nature. Um, and the thing about it, and in this game, remember, he gets hurt, he gets nicked up a little bit. You think he might be done. He wasn't, you know, he had, I think, at one point he had like three catches for 50 yards. Next thing you know, he is like five, six catches for 180 yards. It can happen so fast with him. And how do you cover how do you cover him and Jalen Waddle? Like it's impossible. It's impossible. Because Jalen Waddle, you that means you have to play Jalen Waddle one on one and he's going to destroy you. Going to be like Jalen Waddle is, is going to be an all pro caliber top top young receiver. He already is one of the top young receivers. I, I would put him probably third behind Chase and, and, and uh, Jefferson. But listen, Miami is talented. They're going to be in the playoffs. They're going to make the playoffs. Uh, looking forward to the game this week when they play Buffalo. But now, again, that was a spectacular just uh, performance by Miami in the second half, in particular the fourth quarter. And you know, again, the but that Baltimore defense just not just doesn't scare anybody anymore. They just don't. Games of note, uh Tampa, New Orleans. Listen, um, no surprise with the result here. 2010 Tampa Bay. Uh I'd be a little concerned about the Tampa Bay offense right now. Just a little bit. They haven't played well the first couple of weeks. Um now. New Orleans is a, is a legit top defense. And let's be honest, Dennis Allen has Tom Brady's number. I mean, New Orleans for the game had um, – Dallas had – Tampa Bay had 260 yards for the game. And the only reason Tampa Bay won this game because Jamie, James Winston was James Winston. Three turnovers and the you know, and New Orleans couldn't protect them. He had – you know, they had six sacks. And, of course, you know, again, this game was blown open late in the fourth quarter – much closer game than 20. It was even much closer than 20 to 10. I mean, this was a 3-3 game. From, New Orleans was up in this game, 3 nothing, and tie, it was tied for 3-3 for most of the game before Tampa got the first touchdown. Um, New Orleans is going to lose a lot of these games like this. The defense plays great for three and a half quarters, and then one big play just, you know, shatters the game for them because their offense is just, you know, non-existent. Um, I, you know, they... James Winston is not – is he a starter quarterback? Probably. But, again, he's not a guy he, – He's just, you know, you cannot win with a quarterback that's turnover prone. It's just not going to happen in the NFL. Like, the margin error is too small. The talent is too balanced. Um, little, you know, little tussle. Again, no surprise. These two teams hate each other. Mike Evans and Marshawn Lattimore hate each other. Mike Evans is, is – that was just a dumb – it's just a dumbass move on his part. You can't get – you can't come off the bench – to come at Marshawn Lattimore the way he did. It was stupid. He got suspended. Now he's suspended for the Green Bay game. That could be the difference between home field events or you know, a home playoff game. You never know. Um, even though it's early in September still, these games are big when it comes to seeding and things of that nature. Just dumb on his part. Uh, these two teams hate each other. But, again, Dennis Allen, the head coach, 
you know, who's a defensive guy for New Orleans, continues to baffle Tom Brady. Brady is on the sideline snapping, throwing the iPad and what have you. They definitely are in Brady's head and, and, and just have a hold, a complete hold of that offense. Remember, New Orleans only, Tampa Bay only scored 13 points in this game. They had a pick six. They had a pick six that that, that was a, that the, the, the other touchdown they had. New Orleans just couldn't score. That's, that's all there is to it. So, again, no surprise for, the, for this game in terms of the result. Uh, Philly, Minnesota, Philly, Philadelphia, this game was over at halftime. Uh, Philadelphia just dominated this game from start to finish, 486 yards total. It was the Jalen Hurts, you know, show. Three, he accounted. Uh, he t- threw the ball well, 26-31 for 333. Philly has played well through the first two games, but let's keep in mind they've beaten Detroit and Minnesota. So let's let's – I mean, now again, I right now they're a class of the division based on the fact that Cooper Rush is the Dallas quarterback. But uh, and Philly has improved. Uh, AJ Brown, the defense is slightly improved. Uh, they they draft they you know they did well. <coughs> excuse me, did well with the draft. And most importantly, they're in the heart of the division. I don't. I'm not buying the Giants at all. At all, I'm not buying the Giants. Like the Giants. No, I'm sorry. They, they are probably one of the worst 2-0 and teams you'll see, so I'm not buying them. Um, so, you know, we'll see what happens with Philadelphia. Uh, they uh, should be 3-0 and as they will uh, be, uh, be traveling to Washington for the, the commander, so they should be 3-0, and uh, they should be 3-0 and once uh, uh, come, you know, come the end of this week. Um, but again, Jalen Hurts, is, has been the key to this uh, first couple of games for Philadelphia. We know he's the key to this season. Am I still bought in on – am I all in on Hurts? Not quite yet. We'll see as as teams adjust to him, as when teams really keen in on their running game. Listen, there's, again, if you're Philadelphia, you're playing it right. You are a running football team. Use that to, to exploit some of your – to do some of the play action stuff. Get Hurts out in space. Let Hurts move. You know, we know he's not a, a pocket quarterback. As He's not a pure pocket quarterback right now, and that's part of his game that still needs to develop. But he can move in the pocket. He can make plays outside the pocket. And, of course, we know he is a tremendous guy, is, is, is a tremendous runner. So I, I completely agree with how they're use, utilizing him. But at some point, as, you know, weeks go on and the season goes on, teams will adjust and force him to make plays in, within the pocket. Cincinnati and Dallas, uh, Cincinnati has some serious issues. They lose 2017 with no Dak Prescott. The same, you know, same game, different, different game, same, same song for, uh, same, same song for Cincinnati. Joe, they cannot keep Joe Burrow upright. Six sacks. He's been sacked 10 times in two games. This was a game that was 17 and three that Dallas almost let slip away. Cooper Rush wasn't spectacular. He did enough. Didn't make a big mistake. Um, Again, Cincinnati. When we, me and, and me and Sap have spoke, you know, about this uh, last week. It, like, if you can't block, if you can't block for your franchise quarterback, then I, like you don't have a team. Like, and it doesn't matter about the, their talent. It doesn't matter the weapons. They, you know, they can't block. It's just as simple. That's it. They can't block, and they think about this. They've lost two games to. Mitch Trubisky and Cooper Rush. Think about that for a second. So I know Joe Burrow is downplaying the 0 and 2 start, which he should. Um, especially in public, in the front of the media, you shouldn't. You got 15 games left. You can't panic. But uh, they have some major issues, and it goes beyond just. It's not a Super Bowl hangover. They just have some. Again, they have issues with protection that seemingly is are not going. Seemingly not getting better uh, at all. Nice win for Dallas, but look, you know, I don't, you know, Dallas, Dallas does it like that offense is not very good. Um, defense is decent, but we we probably we spoken about how we feel about Dallas. Like they're not they're not a threat to do anything this year, but though they they will still be in contention for that division uh, until Prescott gets back. Who won the week? Uh, it had to be two a uh, two or Tucker Valoa. Uh, again, when you throw for well over four hundred yards. You come back a twenty-one point comeback on the road against a team that live that some people consider to be a contender to get to the Super Bowl, um, or and and the class of the division. You deserve the uh, you deserve uh, to win the week for the season. Tua 
Court, he leads the NFL in passing yards, and he has seven touchdowns. And again, the one thing now again, I'm not gonna compare him to Patrick Mahomes as far as accuracy, accuracy like Tariq Hill did, but he is a very accurate quarterback. Like the, his ball placement, it's, his ball placement skills are, are spectacular. Like he he puts the ball right on the receiver. That and again, we saw that at at Alabama. That's something you can't teach. You cannot teach accuracy. And that will make up for a lack of height, if, like similar to Drew Brees. That was the one. That's that's the thing that kept Drew Brees in the league for so long at a high level. That he was one of the most accurate quarterbacks in the league for the time that uh for the over the course of his Hall of Fame career. So, uh, Tua w- wins the week with a just spectacular performance on the road, overcoming a couple of interceptions, six touchdowns and six touchdowns, and we'll see what happens as he faces. You know the the acid test playing the best team in football right now in terms of the um, Buffalo Bills. The biggest disappointment has to be the Indianapolis Colts. Indianapolis Colts get shut out by Jacksonville, twenty four to nothing. They are now zero one and one. Could easily be zero and two. How Indianapolis only gets two hundred eighteen total yards against Jacksonville is beyond me. I watched Jacksonville against Washington week one. The defense is like you can move the ball against that defense. Like that, that defense is not very good. But for whatever reason, Jacksonville has owned Indianapolis, especially at home. Um, remember, they put them out the playoffs last year in the last game of the season and picked up where they left off. Matt Ryan, non-factor. The running game was a non-factor. Again, Indianapolis should be embarrassed to be 0-1-1 right now. There's no way you in the in there's no way in the world you should ever be shut out by the Jacksonville Jacks Jaguars. And I I don't know. I again I Indianapolis is. I mean, maybe they're gonna be they're gonna be one of these teams where, you know, we thought that they can make some noise. Who know who knows? They again they're o one and one, in a bad division. The division is bad, so nobody's running away from that because Tennessee is down this year as well, and we know Jacksonville is, isn't any good, and we know Houston is isn't any good. So Indianapolis probably still, with all that being said, they probably still will win that division. But but, but man, they look bad. They they've looked awful these first two weeks. I mean, god awful against. Against bad football teams, I said they should be easily two and zero, easily. They played Houston and Jacksonville. You know they allowed Houston to tie them at home, and they allowed Jacksonville to shut them out. So they have to they have to get some things figured out. Um, again, you are not counting on Matt Ryan to be 2016, 17 Matt Ryan. That though those days are done. Everything's gonna be predicated off the running game and, and what have you. Um, so if they can't run the football, they have no chance, none, of doing anything, uh, 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 let alone contending. Um, we move on to, well, well, I, I will fill in for, for Rob Sapp. So the 49ers uh, were able to take apart the Seahawks 27-7. We saw, unfortunately, uh, at the expense of one Trey Lance who broke his ankle. He's done for the season. But no need to fear because Jimmy G is here. And listen, I we don't, of course you don't want to see anybody get hurt. I don't have any, you know, I don't root for San Francisco, no root against them. So I, you know, I don't have any skin in the game from that standpoint as as a football fan. But let's be honest, if you want to just keep it a, a buck, this was the best possible scenario for everybody. You know, it, to be perfectly honest with you, you have a situation where Jimmy G clearly is a better quarterback right now than Trey Lance. Number one, Jimmy G can, if he plays at a high level, can get paid in the offseason. San Francisco, I think, because no one, no one is running away with the NFC, is a legit Super Bowl contender with that defense and the running game and all the experience they have. We know what Jimmy G and, and Shanahan have done together versus apart. We know, and Trey Lance is not ready to play corner, not ready to be a starting quarterback in the NFL right now. Okay? He can sit rehab learn another year behind Jimmy G um best possible scenario to happen all around and and most importantly there's no split in locker room now you don't have to worry about guys uh, hey questioning the coach hey man you know we own two or whatever whatever Jimmy you sure you sure you don't have Jimmy G you sure we one in three or two and four that's all that's all going going by the wayside like that's it now they better go out there and get a reliable backup because Jimmy G is also injury prone. Not so much like season ending injury prone, but you know, he has some little Anthony Davis in him as far as 
these knickknack injuries where he's out a couple games and not quite the same for about a month. So they better get somebody a decent, reliable backup that kind of knows their system. You're not banking on Jimmy G to, to go through 15 straight games healthy, okay, moving forward. But this is absolutely the best possible scenario, to be honest with you, for San Francisco. And I do think uh, that they are that they are a legit Super Bowl contender because no one's running away from the, with the NFC. There's no dominant team in the NFC. Even Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay is not a dominant team. They're very good. You know, Green Bay rebounded this week, but then you know we know what issues they have with the receiving, with the uh, at the with the receiving core. So, yes, I think San Francisco is a contender, and Jimmy G definitely, uh, you know, is their best quarterback, and will they will. Uh, play well with him on the center stock up stock down stock down stock up of course miami that was a big time win they're two and oh they will have against against they will have the asset test this week playing the buffalo bills a team that has absolutely owned them the running game you had at least you had at least 10 teams rush for over 100 yards only a couple teams lost uh by baltimore lost but for the most part if you ran if you ran the football in week two your team won the game. So, again, we talk about, you know, all the weapons on the outside and high scoring and things like that. Nature. By the way, this season so far, the game has not, these games have not been really high scoring, to be honest with you. I know, you know, you had the wild game with Miami and Baltimore. But if you look across the league, there have been, some, there have been a number of low-scoring games. So, again, you got to be able to run the football. You have to. You have to be able to, especially offensive line. We talked about this last week with Sapp. Offensive line play is just not good right now. There are a number of shaky offensive lines. You have to protect. And that's one thing Tampa Bay has done through the first course of the first couple of games. They ran the ball, even when they've hadn't gotten they haven't gained a lot of yards, but they ran the ball enough to keep to keep uh these defensive lines off Brady off Brady's ass. Uh we saw it with Green Bay on Sunday night. Hey, we're gonna run the ball. They got Jenkins, they got Jenkins back, the Jenkins back, uh the tackle. And we'll, we'll dare you to stop it. And Chicago, of course, had no answer for it as they ran for well over 200 yards in that game. You, uh, The running game will never, never get old. It will never get old running the football. Never. So uh, that, that I would say, stock, stock up is the running game. Stock down, the Vegas Raiders, I don't know how in the world they lost the game to – the Arizona Cardinals. Arizona Cardinals are not well coached right now. Kyler Murray basically beat them by himself. There's no way that that game shouldn't have been 31-10. They were up 20 nothing at home. You're at home against an Arizona team that's really, that just frankly is not well coached. They're just not. There's no offensive foundation or plan in place for Kyler Murray. Kyler Murray was out there playing like, like street basketball, street football out there. And I'm not blaming him. He has no choice has no choice. Uh clearly, clearly there's no there's no strategy with Deion, without DeAndre Hopkins. Clearly. You had the entire offseason, the majority of offseason knowing that he was going to be suspended for the first uh I think what six games. So there's no plan in place is hey Kyler, do you and that's not a plan that's gonna work for that's not going to have any sustainable success over the course of a 17-game NFL season. Uh, Arizona was fortunate to win that game, but that shows you where Vegas is at. Vegas is one of the – they're going to be one of the more inconsistent teams in the league. One quarter, they're going to look great. The the next quarter, they're going to look like the worst team in the league. That's just big. They have a lot of talent, but they just don't have – they don't possess from play to play, quarter to quarter – the necessary level of consistency to be taken seriously. They don't. Baltimore, again, we talked earlier about them. The defense is putrid. Uh I feel I just don't I just don't respect that defense in a big spot. Now against bad teams, sure, their defense will make plays, but against teams with any type of weapons, and again the AFC is loaded with them. I don't trust Baltimore's defense in a big spot to stop a major uh offensive team. We look at week three. Um, there are some heavyweight matchups. Bills, Dolphins. Um, I wonder what the Sap text thread will be like with uh Robert Sapp and his brother. His brother, of course, is a lifelong Bill Dolphins fan. Of course, we know what Robert Sapp is, is in terms of the Buffalo Bills, uh, one of you know, leading members of the Bills mafia. I listen, 
Sap is real con- is concerned about has has expressed how much he concerned how concerned he is about this team. He really has, and even more so than me. Uh, and I thought they would make the playoffs, but Sap is terrified of Tyreek Hill. He is, he just is. Um, I think Buffalo will, will 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 win this game because they are more they they're just more consistent and they are a you know a couple years ahead of Miami as far as their process. But Miami's scary. They are scary offensively. They can they can score in a heartbeat. They again they have some nice players on defense. Uh, the thing about Buffalo right now that's separating them from everybody else in the league, and me and Sap talked about this, is physicality. You play Buffalo, you feel it. I mean, you feel it. Like, and you know, talking about Buffalo, how dominant they've been, dominant they've been. They've outscored their opponents seventy-two to seventeen. They rank um, third in total offense, second in total, third in total offense, second in total defense. So they just like again, and all the pieces fit. All the pieces fit. So they are an absolute well-oiled machine right now. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And that's, like like I said, the Tennessee game, they were supposed to beat the hell out of Tennessee, and they absolutely did. They absolutely did. Packers-Bucks game, I don't have a great feel on this game, and neither do the betters because the, the line is one. The Bucks are basically – it's basically a pick them. The, the game is at Tampa Bay. Now, Aaron Rodgers has been, uh, has been horrible against the Bucks. Over the course of his career, he's one in three. Worst, his worst QBR touchdown to interception ratio. He's thrown multiple pick sixes against the Tampa Bay over the course of his career. Um, that defensive front has always bothered him. The coverages have bothered him, especially last, particularly last year. They should have won the MC Championship a couple of years ago. That game they should have won. Like that, that, that was just embarrassing. We, we, we know what happened with Lafleur not taking the ball basically taking the ball out of, out of Rodgers' hands, and they never got it back. But uh, I don't know. I, I think Tampa probably wins a close game because I'm still not sold on the Green Bay receivers. Tampa Bay has a spectacular secondary. Um, I think they'll be able to contain the Green Bay run. Um, uh, you can make – like ten, Green Bay's defense has not played as up to the part, up to the, up to the level that I thought that they were going to play. Teams have been able to move the ball against Green Bay. Uh, we'll see, you know, now we'll see how that, how that, uh, how they match up against a 10 Bay offense that's not playing well right now. I right, listen, this game, you know, anytime you have two of the greatest quarterbacks of all time, this special game with Brady and Rodgers, the two definitive quarterbacks of, of this generation, of the, of the last, you know, probably last decade, uh, it's not that often they meet. I think this is the fifth time they've met. Um, I think Brady's three and one. Uh, against Rodgers, but uh, listen, these these guys are you know who knows this might be the last time they ever meet. Uh, you know Brady's forty five, Rodgers thirty eight. Rodgers already said he's not playing till forty five, but um, no, probably won't be the last time they meet. I think they'll probably meet the playoffs more than likely. But again, this is a huge game for these for in, in September. We can talk about home field advantage. The Packers need home field advantage, even though it hasn't guaranteed anything. They absolutely need home field advantage to get to the Super Bowl. Um, Tampa Bay, not so much. We've they, we've seen them win on the road. Uh, so again, a litmus test, early litmus test in the AFC for you know pole position with the with, with home field, and, and we see how these teams match up. Uh, now again, come December, we know the NFL changes every. There are four to five twists and turns in every NFL season, so these these two teams might look completely different come uh november and december and january but regards to that big time game certainly looking uh forward to it um a couple of now i'm gonna leave so a couple things before i get to uh roger Federer, i'll only get through i'm gonna leave the udoka situation alone right now because I, I need more details on that i just i need more i haven't uh we know he could be possibly facing suspension for a year uh, having a consensual, you know, affair with a team employee, but that it's more to it than that. Like that, just think of you. You know, you're talking about suspending one of the better coaches in the league that took a team to the finals last year. It it has to be more than that. So I'm gonna hold that off till next week when it gets when, when that picture becomes more clear. As far as Robert Sarver, listen, money talks, sponsorship talk. Period. What happened with that is the sponsorship said, "Listen, get him the fuck up out of here." Period. 
and the NBA said, hey, Robert, sponsors, like, what, like the NBA owners basically said, hey, you got to go, man. That's it. Don't make us, don't make us publicly vote you out. So take the $2.2 billion and keep it moving. No one, and, and, and let's not make this a story. This is, this is actually the best possible case. This is actually the best possible thing that can happen in the NBA from that standpoint. Because now, once he sells the team, uh, and he says he's going to sell the Mercury and he says he's going to sell the Suns, no one will be talking about this shit in October around training camp. No one, no one. It will not be a story. So it will not be a black cloud hanging over the NBA's head for the entire season. No one will give a shit about Robert Sarver after, like, in, in about two in about two to three weeks when the NBA season starts, okay? If you're Robert Sarver, this is an easy move. This is It kind of reminds me of Irvin Burrell uh, in, in the wire season, in season five. Don't go out kicking and screaming. Take, listen, go out, take your losses, take your, you know, take your fire, take your L, whatever. You'll be playing golf and making just as much money at, and just like Urban Burrell did in season five, Robert Sarver says, "Hey, I'll take the two. I'll take the two billion dollars and keep it moving. Period." Now, and, and as far as the uh, as far as you know, the hey, we you know cancel culture and unforgiving culture and all that bullshit. You can miss me with that. Nobody like nobody cares. I I I love how people like try to bring up God after <laughs> after they had done some shit <laughs> that they get them caught up. Uh, I'm like, you know, I believe in forgiveness. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, Robert, let's, please. I mean, like, enough, enough already with that. But anyway, he's going to be, this is the best possible, uh, best case scenario for the NBA for everybody involved. The players are not going to have to answer questions about it. Uh, and you don't have this, you know, this, you know, this nutcase running a uh, franchise who, you know, who had no business uh, owning a team after what after what the reports that we read over the last year or so. So this is the end. If, you if you're in the NBA, you have to be happy about this. This is already a story. And the bottom line is the sponsorship said, hey, get him the fuck up out of there. You owners, get him the fuck up out of here before we start cutting your sponsors, before so we start cutting your money. That's exactly what happened. Without even knowing the details, I'm telling you what happened. When Because th- when you go from, vehemently saying, I'm not going to sell the team to, hey, by the way, yeah, I think I'm going to sell both, not only the feet, not only the Suns, but the Mercury. That's that sponsorship. The, the owners have told you, you are you are going to sell the team or we're going to vote you out because these sponsors have started saying, have started have started pulling out. That's all, that's, that's exact, I'm telling you what, that this is exactly what happened. Exactly what happened with that situation. So, the NBA is better off for it. The Phoenix Suns are better off for it. The Mercury, everybody, everybody wins. Even Robert Sarver wins. He's going to get two point whatever billion dollars. So there you go with that. Um, I'm not going to say sad news because all good things come to an end. Uh, Robert, uh, not Robert, excuse me, Roger Federer, of course, re- retired last week at the age of 41. He's had a litany of injuries the past two to three years uh, since, especially, basically since the uh, 2020 um U.S. Open uh, or 2020 U.S. Open. He has not been. He hasn't been the same player since that. Since he lost that just dramatic Wimbledon championship, just the torturous Wimbledon final against jo- Novak Djokovic, where he was up had two match points on his serve. I that that match hurt me because I wanted him. To, I can't stand Djokovic, and I've, I've been a Federer guy uh, for the bad part of his career. Federer, a huge Federer fan. Uh, but that was his last shot at winning uh, another Grand Slam. Um, he never even he well he made it to a semifinals of a couple more, but for the most part, that was his last best shot. He retires at the age of forty one with twenty Grand Slams. And I listen, we can go back and forth and back and forth with the goat conversation with Nadal, Federer, and 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 uh, Djokovic. There are three goats in tennis. Those three are heads and shoulders above everybody. It's not even close. I like I can make a case for either for any one of the three. When he was at his his pinnacle, his peak, apex, Roger Federer was the greatest tennis player of all time. Like the best version of Roger Federer was better than any version of any tennis player that's ever lived, because you had the guy that can play on all surfaces. Think about this, right? He won five straight U.S. Opens and five straight Wimbledon's. Okay, and with basically within the same time span, he. The Wimbledon's were from 2003 to 2007. The U.S. Opens were from 2004 to 2008. So basically, 
basically to win five straight Grand Slam, uh, five straight Grand Slams on the same surface on different surfaces is not. It will never that that is the most impressive to me accomplishment that any tennis player has ever had. Well, maybe with uh, with the great exception of when Borg Borg was 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 winning the French Open out the Borg French Open Wimbledon was ridiculous too. I think that 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 was um that has to be right there next to it. But it is it is it was it is inversely impossible to do that. To win five straight grand slam five straight term uh grand slams on on two different surfaces uh is unheard of. And to me, again, when he 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 wasn't just a tennis player. He was like playing with him what play watching him play tennis was like an artist. He was an artist out there with the creativity, the shot making, the grit the the grace uh, how he moved, it, you know, it was so fluid. Um, and again, he just made the game look easy. And the thing about it is, he always evolved. Like he would change up, he changed coaches, he would change styles, he would do. Uh, remember the the saber, the, the and again, the last time he really changed his style, he Nate all couldn't beat him. You look at what he, you look at his record against Nate all the last like. 10 matches. I think he's like 8-1 and one against Nadal in his last nine matches, or 9-1. and one. Like He owned Nadal at the end of his career. At the end of his career. Including beating him at Wimbledon in 2019, which was a classic match in four sets. So, certainly we'll miss, certainly you hate to see him go out because of his injury, but again, 41 is 41. Um, again, I, there's no player I've ever enjoyed watching play tennis more than Roger Federer. Yeah, that's just all there is to it. Uh, one of the great tennis players, one of the great, frankly, athletes of all time, to be honest with you. He's in that conversation as well. Um, so he's gone. He's done at the age of 41. Uh, he's supposed to be playing in this doubles event with uh, Rafael Nadal. They are, of course, very close friends. Nadal, Djokovic and Federer don't get along. Nadal and Federer, you know, are extremely close uh, in terms of the respect factor, the respect factor that they've had um, uh, with their rivalry. Uh, so it makes sense that they would play uh, that his finals doubles match, his doubles match will, will be with, with Nadal. They've had, I, I think, the great, maybe the greatest match of all time in 2008, Wimbledon, which, again, that that was just an insane match to watch with the tie breaks and, and you know, the, that final fifth set and Nadal finally breaking through and, and, and beating Federer at Wimbledon, Wimbledon, which really, you know, elevated Nadal, his status. But this is a guy that again, Federer, he again just this guy, you know, 31, think about it, 31, he would always he was like, you know, kind of like Jack Nicholas in golf, always was contending, always was in the mix. Always. Uh, you know, he gets off to the seven and zero start in, in major finals, ten and one in his first eleven finals. Um had the match, the classic match that that really was the pass the torch match against Pete Sampras. In 2001 at Wimbledon, when you know we didn't really know who he was at that time, we knew he was talented, but he was inconsistent, and that match changed the course of his career. It still, you know, would take him a couple of years to win a Grand Slam, but once he when he started winning them, he didn't stop for a while. Like that period from 2003 to say 2010 was as dominant of a stretch of, of tennis that we've ever seen. Period. So. Again, nothing lasts forever. Forty-one years old is forty-one is forty-one, and but he certainly will be missed as one of the goats in the history of tennis. Uh, that's going to wrap it up for this latest edition of the Real Deal Podcast. As always, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, go to you know at AMC Lifestyle for all calculated measures for 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 uh, check out gear, hats, shirts, and what have you from uh, my man Adrian McDonald. Um, have a great, great Thursday and rest. Enjoy your football weekend. We will see you next time.